Butyl gloves. Of course, the N95 masks that are so very, very important. Isolation gowns, face shields, thermometers, foot coverings, Tyvek coveralls, ventilator tubing. Um, let me just give an example. Of, of why we need this so very, very much. Uh, it takes a total of 66 pieces of PPE for one patient for one day. And so we must conserve, conserve, conserve this life-saving gear. Uh, I want everyone who has already assisted in this effort, I, I want to thank them. We, we've had a lot of help on this, but we need more help. Uh, businesses have shared their PPE. Uh, our outstanding career and technical schools have done the same. Uh, so everyone who's not directly in the medical field has really come forward. Construction and other businesses have shared theirs. Uh, our dentists and veterinarians have shared theirs. So to all of you, thank you very, very much, but we need more help. And that is the list, and you can find this list again right here on our webpage right there. So I'm not going to now uh, turn it over to Dr. Acton. Uh, Amy. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are low tech today, but I think in some ways it's a good thing because I've really wanted to take us back to some basics. I know I've been sharing a lot of numbers and graphs and data. And that's useful because there are some folks out there that I need to have that information. Um, mostly our hospitals and others who are doing a lot of the planning, but I know the media has a lot of curiosity to know some of the numbers. So we've always said we'll share with you what we know. But today I really want to go back to basics and tell you what all of it means. But first I'll start off with our numbers for today. Um, we know that we have confirmed uh, 1,406 cases, um, and that ages, the age range in that is less than a year, so an infant to the age of 96 with a median age of 52 years. Um, we have 24% of our cases are hospitalized, 9% in the ICU, and um, I'm sorry to share today that we have 25 deaths in the state of Ohio. Um, we also know that we have cases in now 66 of our counties. That's well over 75% of our counties. Again, all this data is the tip of the iceberg because we're still, um, and it's skewed by the fact that we're testing the sickest, um, those who are hospitalized in priority and our frontline healthcare workers. And we know there are some counties out there that don't have testing right now. Um, so I wanna share that with you. Um, there's much more detail on our website, coronavirus.ohio.gov, which is also a place you can find everything that we share here. I know you get some different links at times, uh, the new Together site, but we'll keep all that on one spot for you if you, if you don't catch something. I do want to follow up with uh, Quest uh, and LabCorp. Thank you so much to our friends out there that are in the private sector lab companies. Um, what the governor was saying is so important. We know you're getting slammed with a huge volume of tests from often many states, but it's so vital right now. Our, our data is lagging, as you know, uh, five days at the least. Um, and what you can also share that's important, not just the positive tests, but aggregate counts of people who are tested. So the total number of tests you've run and the negative test results. If you could give those to the Ohio Department of Health along with those positive test results, um, again, on our website, coronavirus.ohio.gov, that will help us as a state do the most accurate planning. Very important to us and we really appreciate you doing that. I know we're all in this together and I know it's a hard, hard lift. Um, so I want to go back to my hurricane analogy. We said early on that this is an unprecedented situation and very much like a hurricane, you start to know it's coming. So I want you to picture a hurricane out somewhere in the Caribbean in the early days when we first hear about it on the Weather Channel. 
And you know, they're, they're telling us where it will land. Is at first, they give you an estimate. It might be somewhere between Texas or maybe the Gulf Coast on Florida, and then maybe it's the East Coast of Florida. But they can't tell you exactly when it will hit or where it will hit. But as the days go on, you get a little bit closer. It gets more accurate. You start to see that trajectory of that hurricane. And so your predictions get better and better with time. Very early on in this hurricane, we talked a lot about Philadelphia and St. Louis, two cities during the great pandemic flu of 1918, two weeks difference in taking actions of social distancing and shutting it down, staying at home, made all the difference in the outcome. So very similarly, our models, which we have different modelers all over the country, they're giving us a compass. They know it's going on this trajectory, but the exact day it hits, the exact city and neighborhood is always a little off till it gets closer. So I'm saying large numbers to you, and I know they're scary. 8,000 cases a day, 10,000 cases a day. Those numbers, given 11.7 million people, are actually not that far apart. I know they sound drastically different. They're not that different. But the more important thing is this. Those numbers are helpful to our planners, but for the rest of us, what it is saying is that we are flattening the curve in Ohio. Those numbers would have been 50 to 75% higher than they are right now. Our curve would have been much steeper had we not acted starting a couple of weeks ago. So every action you're taking at home is actually, in the case of a hurricane, changing how hard that storm will hit and changing where and when it will hit. So the actions you're taking at home are shrinking those numbers. So I want us to go back to our original chart. Ohioans, what we know is this. We know we are blunting this yellow and becoming the blue. We are stretching out the day of peak impact of the hurricane. And we're actually making that hurricane not a four or five, we're making it a three or a two. There's no scenario without a hurricane, as I've said. Um, and now we know that this line of hospital capacity is moving down. We know that it's somewhere in the blue curve. That was our original calculation. But think about this line. Think about how many more masks, how much more PPE, how many more hospital beds, how much our, our general would have to build out if we were on this yellow curve. 75% more. We know that this is probably more down here now on the blue level. We know that there is no healthcare system in the world that would have had all the beds and all the ventilators in the world. We know we need more, but you at home have helped us buy time and really impact how much we will need. So our hospitals are using that data. They're using the best modeling available and they differ a little bit. And that's not really important to us. What's important is that every day we lock it down, every day we don't spread the six degrees of Kevin Bacon disease, that doubling makes all the difference for our frontline healthcare workers. It makes our PPE go farther. It makes us need less ventilators. So we need all that and we're building it, but you need to know that what we do and we keep doing it and doing it even better and better all the time is really changing the strength of this hurricane. We know the wave's coming, but we know it's getting smaller every day in Ohio because of what you're doing. That's so important. So another message. I want us to think a lot in our neighborhoods now. We're sort of living in little villages, as we should. And we're using a lot of low-tech things. When we already have Facebook groups with our neighbors and a lot of other technology at our hands. But I want you to think about the elderly in your neighborhood. And to elderly here, Ohio, like Italy, skews to an older population, and in some counties particularly so, in some neighborhoods particularly so. We know that the elderly are extremely vulnerable. We still can all go out if we need to, grocery shop once a week. But I'd much rather our elderly not have to go out at all. 
So I really need to you to use your neighborhood social networks. There are other existing structures like village to village, nonprofit work that's going on in neighborhoods. You can look that up. But ways we can all chip in, help out with the yard work, help out dropping off food. We really need our most vulnerable to be able to stay at home. So I'm asking neighborhoods to do that. I know neighborhoods are doing things already, but we need more of it. The free lending library, the place where people's dogs stop and get bones and food, um, library books, helping with gardening, those sorts of things really go a long way. I'll share one last thing. Um, for those of you who know me, um, I'd much rather be outside digging in the dirt about right now. And you know, it is beautiful out. Our bulbs are going. It's time to start dividing plants. Again, we have urban gardeners. When I worked um, for the Columbus Foundation, I did so much to empower our urban gardening movement. We need to get people outside doing the thing that is a great mental health. If you haven't done it before, I know it's always scary, but it's actually so much easier. But we can also be sharing some of those plants, doing some of that gardening, getting out of doors, single-handedly, you can be alone. Being out there in nature is gonna help you feel better. So let's get out there and help each other with that as well, um, at a distance, at a social distance. So enjoy the beautiful weather, keep socially distant, help those who are most vulnerable. Thank you. Heard it, but there's thunder out there. So oh, yeah, I, I thought it was a beautiful. I thought it was a beautiful day a couple hours ago when we came in here, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Well, things change quickly around here. That's for sure. Uh, Dr. Acton, thank you, and Governor Dewine, thank you very much. Uh, a bit, a bit of a uh, little bit of good news uh, to start. Um, we know that a lot of students uh, out there are. Uh, and their schools. Governor and I had a chance to talk with some teachers yesterday. We hear from a lot of superintendents. Th really want to thank everybody in the education community for what they are doing to help the learning continue, uh, even as students are not congregating in their, in their schools. There's a great resource that the Ohio uh, public television stations are going to start providing starting tomorrow. Uh, it, it, we know that a lot of people a lot of students don't have access to the internet. Um, there are 300,000 households that don't have it. And because of the demand that's out there for people using the internet, whether it's watching movies or whatever it is that they may be doing, we know that even if you have it, sometimes it's slow and a little clunky and, and you're not able to get there. But the Ohio uh, broadcasting stations, Ohio's all eight of the public broadcasting stations are offering uh, some uh, programming that will start tomorrow throughout the day from pre-K all the way through high school that will be educational television that students can, can uh, tune into. And uh, we're going to put, uh, we have this all linked at coronavirus.ohio.gov slash learn at home. And I already went on and checked it out, and there's some stuff in there that I might even decide to watch because it's, it's just great stuff. We really appreciate, uh, we really appreciate the, the public broadcasting doing this. It helps supplement what the students need to continue their learning experience at home. This is incredibly important uh, that they continue to do this. We don't want them to fall behind. We know that it's really important for students to continue to climb that educational mountain and to continue to learn and to, to put the best use of this time that they have together. And this will begin tomorrow uh, or I mean on Monday, March the 30th, is when the programming will be available. We thank our public broadcasting stations for doing that. You heard um, both uh, Senator Portman and Senator Brown and uh, talk about in the last two days the federal package that President Trump signed uh, yesterday. Uh, what also had to happen is that the states needed to opt in to the unemployment aspect of this. Governor DeWine signed uh, a document just uh, a short time ago that would opt Ohio in to all five provisions of this, which includes 1099 and self-employed individuals. It will be effective retroactively to uh, January the 27th and will be available for 39 weeks going forward along with a variety of other uh, uh, services that were, was in that bill. 
The one thing I want you to know is that while it will be, uh, they'll be eligible starting tomorrow, the system will not be up and running tomorrow. It, it just, this is a brand new program. No states were prepared. Uh, no states have a system ready for this, but you should know that we've engaged the private sector to help the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services uh, build this system out as quickly as we can so that you'll be able to get on there and enroll. Uh, we're going, we'll go as fast as we can. Uh, I also want to note that they have expanded services for the traditional unemployment program, opened up phone lines on weekdays from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, they were open from 9 to 1 today. They've never been open on Saturdays before, but we've stood them up. And plus, uh, you have the, uh, we added 100 new people to man those phone lines, by the way, uh, and the website unemployment.ohio.gov, we've expanded the capacity of that by 20 times what it normally is. So we're, and that's operational 24 hours a day. So please uh, know that that capacity is being built up. And remember that even if you're unable to get through because of heavy volume, uh, either on the, the end that you're sending from or the end you're trying to enter into our system, that you will be eligible for all of your benefits retroactively. You will not miss any benefits. And once you are qualified, the, the first resources checks should be essentially mailed within uh, and received within seven to 10 days. So the team is pushing on this. Uh, they're pushing to make this happen as quickly as possible, and we thank uh, we thank all the team that's working on this. Governor did mention about what we're doing to try to hold people accountable. Uh, they're out there. They may be an essential business. And they may be a contractor, highway contractor, building contractor of some kind. You have to follow the rules. We re we reiterate reiterate that. Um, you just cannot operate if you can't follow the item 18 essential. Uh, health and safety standards that are in the stay-at-home order. And understand that even when we start to phase out of this in the future, don't think habits even as we come out of this. So if you're just know that this is going to be with us for a while, prepare for it and follow it. And the one important thing that we emphasized in some of our calls earlier today, just because the CEO of the company says that we want to do this, and the HR department writes a policy, you have to make sure it's getting delivered on the front lines with the work crews on the factory floors. That's where it matters the most and it has to, to, to uh, penetrate all the way through the system and be followed all the way through the system. Uh, that's essential. And uh, I do want to thank everybody, all the workers out there who are doing their part. This is so, so very important. And the innovators and entrepreneurs who are going to help that list that, that list that Governor DeWine and Dr. Acton held up, we have some great innovative, oh, that's Ohio's DNA. We, we make things. And, and so please help us do this. Uh, we, we super appreciate that. And Governor, one, one final point of, of personal privilege here. My daughter Katie turns 13 tomorrow. And, uh, and she has not seen her dad much over the last 21 days. And probably more important to her, she hasn't been able to see her friends for the past 21 days. And so we wish her a happy birthday. And, uh, and everybody out there, uh, keep your chin up. We're fighting through this. We're, we're going to get through it. Uh, and, uh, and if you listen to what Dr. Acton said, uh, you know that model uh, of what we're expecting, we can all change it. By our actions, by our actions, we can be part of the solution. And we ask everybody to do that. Thank you. We're happy to uh, answer any questions. Good afternoon, Governor DeWine. This is Laura Hancock from Cleveland.com. Um, you have talked about how the state has been divided into eight hospital regions and the hospitals in each region need to work together to come up with the plan. Um, what happens if someone has coronavirus and they are, they, the hospital in their region is outside of their insurance network? Um, what should they do? I'll turn to the doctor here. <laughs> Well, Laura, I'm going to get back to you with more details on that. But everyone, uh, I've heard horrifying stories 
of people showing up for places without insurance and being turned away around this country. Ohio, we, we can't do that. This is an emergency. We all take everyone and we figure out the back end later. This, this isn't about billable at this point. And you know, not everyone in Ohio has a doctor. Um, I'm asking all clinicians and all people to help. Help, we'll get information out to you. Um, we're working on that plan, as the governor said, by Monday. We'll be rolling out more and more details to Ohioans, and, and the hospitals will be sharing this, and, and we'll be sharing this through all our clinician channels. But don't turn anyone away. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually have something to share with you on that. Literally, one of the very first calls that we started to make as this started out was to the health plans. Uh, we got a hold of them. We worked. Uh, we made them aware that they should not be denying uh, people coverage. That they should be prompt paying to their hospitals so that people can that, that that their entire system can get through this. And to their credit, they have been very responsive to that. Uh, I am not aware. Uh, I'm not aware of of any denials that, that uh, we have heard of. And if we do. Uh, we will take action on it. But right now, to their credit, they, they have been in this, you know, we're all in this together, that's the phrase, and that even means uh, our entire payer system and the healthcare system. And, and uh, so far, they're aware and, and they know that that has been something that the governor has wanted from day one. service and for the answers if you could speak up because it's raining pretty hard so we're having some trouble here and back here uh, for you and dr. Acton could you talk about Ohio's supply of ventilators given President Trump's statements yesterday on trying to build a hundred thousand in the next hundred days and any logistical details on how the National Guard's gonna be helping ramp up hospital supplies or is that uh, kind of waiting till Monday. Well, let me, let me start with the National Guard. Um, General Harris now wears two hats. Uh, one is heading up this, this operation. He was a logical person to do it. Uh, has, a, has a background in, 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 in that, obviously, in that area and putting people together. Um, this is what the military does so very, very well. Uh, they get things done. Uh, they make things happen. And so I've charged him with making things happen. Uh, I've quoted him... Uh, uh, John Wayne, that we we got to hurry up. We're burning daylight, and uh, I say that every day to to our team. So there's a real sense of urgency. Um, we didn't need any additional sense of urgency, but certainly the report we got from the clinic yesterday uh, assures us that this sense of urgency is is needs to, needs to be there. So, you know, they will be involved uh, in overseeing what's going on. They're going to surge in and help where they can. Um, my guess is that the guard's presence will be more in one region maybe than another region, just depending on what the needs are and what exactly is happening. May also depend upon what the private sector can do and the private contractors will be able to do. Uh, the whole goal is to get all of this up as, as, as quickly as we can. Uh, in regard to the ventilators, this is certainly on our list of, of items that our team is working uh, every single day to, to try to obtain more. Uh, I'm going to refer to Dr. Acton in regard to where she thinks we are uh, in, in regard to that, but we certainly are, uh, you know, wanting additional ones uh, and need help in that area. Thank you. And, and our numbers are not exact, but we know that Given our projections, we estimated that there would be a 40% increased need across the system. But there's also been some innovation that's come along where we can use a ventilator for multiple patients. So you saw in the governor's list today, um, there's tubing. And we're putting specs, uh, specifications that are industry standards um, to get those out on our website as well just so folks who have this in other lines of business or people who want to be making them, we're also trying to procure them. So we're looking at all aspects of the supply chain, 
But um, we did do a graph, it's probably on our website a couple days ago where we showed different PPE with some rough numbers of those estimates. It's tricky because we're also bringing things in from um, other uses. Um, we are bringing things out of um, some ambulatory surgical centers where they were used for elective surgery. Maybe an orthopedic surgeon might have used them. They might be able to donate to their larger region's cause, but where they move it is going to depend on how each region is best situating their resources. So it's going to be regional. And, you know, we will share everything, you know, it's, it's shareable, we will share it with you. So please don't think we're waiting to Monday to work on this because people are working around the clock on this. But um, we think it's really important, especially to viewers at home, that we communicate something that is as, as finished a product as possible so that we don't confuse them additionally. And Thank you. We have at least two of our hospitals that are working, uh, have, have figured out how to put more than one person on the ventilator. So. Uh, you know, they're trying to uh, expand what they have. So innovation is, uh, is certainly is, is going on and is, is occurring. Hi, Governor. Eric Halpern with NBC4. Uh, yesterday we heard here in Columbus that there have been hundreds of complaints about businesses that are open not necessarily following the sanitation guidelines that have been set forth in the order. Is this an issue that's happening across the state? Have you heard about other complaints? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. Uh, this is something that when we had a conversation with the mayors this morning, uh, you know, they gave, they gave a little report. Uh, what I know uh, is going on, though, is that different health departments are going out and, and inspecting and, and actually closing some businesses that are not essential. So you could expect that that will continue. Um, you know, again, our message uh, is that if you look at that sheet, uh, if you look at what we put out and you're not in there, you're not an exception to the rule, um, you, you, business needs to close. Uh, if you are an exception, you still need to follow the uh, distancing and all the other requirements. And frankly, if you cannot re follow that, then you cannot be open. Uh, so it, it's pretty basic. Um, today, I've asked uh, all the chiefs of police um, who represent many of them, uh, the smaller communities, to kind of give us a report about what they're seeing out there uh, as far as the compliance with, with the order. Uh, they're the ones who really, along with the mayors, uh, really know their communities. Uh, they know what's going on. And so I'm anxious to get that report back uh, tomorrow or Monday uh, as, they're, as they're sending emails back in, and we're going to take a look at that and try to assess exactly where we are. And, in, in direct answer to your question, how's it going around the state? Uh, we'll, we'll keep you informed uh, Monday in regard to the, what we find out. Thank you. Good afternoon, Jeff Reddick from uh, ABC6 here in Columbus. A question specifically for Dr. Acton. Uh, again, since those numbers came out that you mentioned, uh, I believe on Thursday, anywhere between six or eight or 10,000 cases a day as could come up. I know you mentioned before why those numbers are useful, even though they're scary, but we've had plenty of comments from people asking how those numbers came to be and whether they were based on any prior known numbers in the world, because they do seem to be very, very large. Are they a worst case scenario? And, and where did that data come from? So the numbers are a range, and that is the, you know, as the model gets better data fed into it, the more cases and the more information we can put into it, the closer and closer it gets. I can tell you that it was already predicting um, how many cases we would have today. So it's getting better and better all the time. But those numbers actually, I mean, I know that sounds like a lot, but if you think about you know, the fact that we're only testing a fractional amount of the people out there. When I say that there are going to be eight or 10,000 cases in a day, and you're looking at the doubling and spreading of this infectious disease, that really isn't a huge amount of Ohioans. As we know, this disease is going to continue to spread. It might spread slower, and it might spread more over time. Um, that's what we want because of the actions we're taking so that we don't overrun our hospital system. But it is spreading, and those numbers are increasing. Now, there's complicated modeling involved. Um, and I, we have people now even, um, and I've heard recently about an OSU researcher doing sort of a video on modeling, because I think that would be really useful for people who, like me, might want to geek out on some of the modeling understanding. 
but basically what it is doing is looking at the effectiveness of our social measures, which we, even the effectiveness of our non-pharmacologic interventions, our staying home or not spreading it, that lags. The effectiveness of that will show up in our data two weeks from now. So as you can see, that gets complicated. And, th and so there's a range of effectiveness of what we're doing. We're maximizing as much we can that variable. And then there is how much we stop spreading it. I said yesterday there's something called SIR. It's susceptible people, infected people, and recovered people. All of that data is lagging. So our estimates many times are underestimates, but that the model actually tries to take into account sort of what we think based on what we're testing. I know it's complicated. I know that scares people. You don't have to trust the modeling to see what is happening. If there's anyone out there who thinks that um, New York, Louisiana, New Jersey, what's happening in Michigan right now is not gonna happen across a border in a state, I, I don't know what more to, to say. This is what we expect from an infectious disease. It's expected that it is gonna spread, um, and it's gonna spread in this way, and it's expected that it's gonna put a severe pressure on all our healthcare systems. And we are treating it as such, and we are, as the governor said yesterday, make no mistake about it, in Ohio, we are, we are planning for worst case scenarios with the hope that we, everything we do takes us away from that. And it is, go back to our graph, that's on our website, and in the shadows, you can see the movement. What it's saying is everything we're doing is lengthening the onset of that peak time, and it's flattening that curve. And the evidence shows already in Ohio that that's happening. How good it will be depends on us. How good it will be depends a lot on us. And then our job for you is to put forward the best response we possibly can. And we, we live in the world we live in. Um, this is where we're at. We'll have better and better data and testing in the months, weeks to come and months to come that will help us even better strategize the recovery and who can go back to work. And I'll tell you, every day I'm waiting for that state-of-the-art testing. We're going after it here in Ohio because we want to be one of the first to implement the best practices of recovery. Thanks, Thank you. Dr. Acton was just saying there, I spent last night um, looking at the modeling and, and looking at the factors that go in. And Dr. Acton and I talked about this earlier today. You can impact this because one of the factors that they include is compliance with so, social distancing uh, measures that have been put in place. And so there are different scenarios that get run based on our very own compliance and it is one of the leading, the leading indicators in the model about where we will end up being. So, I mean, literally the stuff that Dr. Acton, the governor and I are asking people to do, you impact the ultimate number by how we behave. And that's the one thing that we, I wanna empower people in their own minds and their own lives to know that that number is not our destiny, that number is affected by our behavior. Yeah, to be specific, Lieutenant Governor is absolutely right. If you look at these models, and you can just look them up on, online, you'll see them. They, they assume, okay, we assume this much um, compliance. We assume this much compliance, this much compliance with the social distancing. And each one, when you change that number, you change the end, you change the end result. And so it's uh, you know, it's, it, it's hard to determine exactly where we are with social distancing, it's, it's, but they put in basic assumptions and how much we are in compliance. You start with zero and then just work their way, work their way up and the results just change on the other, on the other end. Hi everyone, Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio and Television, State House News Bureau. Um, it was sort of mentioned earlier that Ohio's sort of in this beneficial position of not seeing its peak yet, whereas, you know, places like Washington, Washington and New York, we can sort of learn from what is happening there. And one of the stories we're kind of seeing is emotional, a rise of emotional trauma among healthcare workers. As we build up hospital capacity and medical capacity, is there any thought given into like sort of shoring up mental health reassurances for healthcare workers? 
Well, I think that's a very, very good issue. Uh, Lord Chris is, is working on that. Um, I would also say that, uh, uh, another more thunder. Um, Sorry, one of the things that I think that is so very important for their mental health is the PPE. Uh, you know, that gives them some assurance. When they don't have it, uh, it has to cause great frustration and, and great, great concern. So we can help them. And again, I'll make my appeal. But if you're a manufacturer out there and you can make any of this stuff, man, we want to hear from you right away. Uh, if you've got some of it, we, we need it. Uh, we need it to, so we can get it out. And it's not just the folks in the hospitals. We've got people in nursing homes uh, who go in every single day and work in nursing homes, and they, they need protection. Uh, it, it, as well. So uh, that, I think that's one thing. Dr. Acton. Yes. Thank you, Andy. Um, I've been following some of the stories. I think I shared yesterday that I started out my career in the Bronx at Albert Einstein, Jacoby, um, in an in a equally sort of um, half the kids in my practice were going to be dead by the age of three from HIV AIDS. And it was a brutal time. And I remember what it felt like to be out on those front lines. And I'm watching the workers talk about it all over this country today. Um, it is a real trauma. There are things we can do. We're blessed to have uh, Director Lori Chris and her team. They actually have been leaders in this field about getting teams out to help in traumatic situations. So we are, we are actively looking at ways to support our healthcare workers. But as the governor said, the things we're doing are letting them know um, in real ways with the gear we can get, but also in our support of staying home and taking care of things so that they can focus on the very, very hard things at hand. If you're a healthcare worker out there, and I've talked to a lot of you, I've talked to a lot of nursing home workers, again, our deepest, deepest gratitude. I know for some of you, you've never seen this in your career. Most of us have never been in battlefield situations, um, and, and it is traumatizing. And I want you to take, just knowing that, Please just acknowledge and give a name to what you're going through. Acknowledge it with each other. That's the beginning. Um, thank you so much for what you're doing, and we're going to back you up with support services. Thank you. Would you mind expanding just a little bit about how important having PPE can play a role into being mentally healthy throughout the process? You know, I think a lot of people are afraid because we are in a conservation mode. And so one of the things we're working on, and today um, a team has been putting out guidance, and specifically to nursing homes. We know they're running out of gear all over the state, and everything we have we're trying to push out to them. But right now they're having to do things, they've been doing this for a couple weeks now, where they have to wear the same gown for longer than you normally would wear a gown. If you're wearing a mask, we're gonna be asking nursing homes to wear the mask, assume everyone in your nursing home is infected without even knowing, without even being tested. We're asking workers now, and there'll be guidance coming out through their professional organizations, through our usual way of giving healthcare advice, to wear that mask all day on your shift. So we're gonna be doing things with gear that we've not done before. We're using the best science to guide those recommendations to them, and I want them to know that. We're gonna be giving you guidance, and we're giving that uniformly across Ohio so that um, they know how to best protect themselves, and that's something we can do to help them in a hard situation at least know what they're doing makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dan Pasiak, WHIO Dayton. Um, in regards to churches that are still insist on holding services in person. I mean, is there anything you can do about it? Can the state do anything about it? Well, we made the decision when we issued the order uh, not to infringe upon people's religious liberty. Uh, but it just seems to me that it's a huge mistake uh, for any pastor, any church uh, to bring people together. Uh, tomorrow or any other day. Um, this is a critical period of time, and it's not just for the safety of the people in your congregation. Frankly, it's for the safety of their friends, their neighbors, and total, total strangers. So uh, I just can't imagine that anyone would want to take that risk. I can't imagine that anyone would want to bring, bring people together. Um, there are great opportunities uh, that are being utilized uh, by Facebook. Uh, um, 
other radio, TV. Uh, there's different ways that, that our, our different churches are doing this, and they're still reaching their congregation. Um, so, again, you know, this, I think it would be a huge mistake when, when, when people do this. Eric Halpern with NBC4. Question for Dr. Acton. Um, when we talk about increasing hospital capacity, I know some of those plans are still in the works, but whether it's going to be convention centers, hotels, college dorms, are the COVID-19 cases going to be kept sort of, you know, in the existing capacity and maybe some less severe things in the new buildings? How will that work? We will certainly be working alongside and have been all along our, our hospitals. Um, they're, they're really, um, again, this is an unprecedented experience, even for hospital CEOs. Um, we've never seen something like this in our country. And they are working tirelessly to figure out what works best in their community, and each community varies. I know we're here in Columbus. I know there's information out that was published today about the convention center. And some, in some situations, hospitals will become COVID hospitals and focus on that and take less acuity, which means people with maybe more easily managed that we can keep you separate from an infectious exposure in a different facility. But what that looks like in each community based on their unique geography and their unique sort of a uh, assets of their hospitals will be different. Um, but you will see that. You will see um, some setup of things that keep infectious people away from people who aren't infectious. And how they best use that and move equipment around and move staffing around will vary. Um, but what they're doing is maximizing that based on the unique needs of that region. And I want to say, you know, we know we have three big metropolitan areas um, with significant assets. We have Cleveland, Cincinnati, um, and Columbus. We also have eight sort of other mid-sized cities. So if you think about it that way, but we have hospital systems and those systems already have containment areas. They have hospitals, for instance, Ohio Health might have a hospital in Marietta that does lower acuity work, but so, sort of the harder cases uh, might come into a Riverside. That same sort of containment area model is being put on steroids and being maximized. But what's unique and what's so wonderful about what Ohio hospitals are doing is they're working together. It's not just Ohio Health and OSU and Mount Carmel. They're working together on plans together. Uh, they're setting aside all those normal business relationships so that they can maximize what's best. And they're doing that in partnership with their civic leaders, their mayors, their county commissioners, and of course with the local health departments, those chief health strategists who are looking at population health. They're doing it with their nursing homes. Uh, they're doing it with their EMS and frontline providers. They're really max, you know, they've had plans all along for disasters, but they're making those, building them out for this unique situation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Luis Gill from Ohio Latino TV. And this may be a question for Dr. Acton, where is there a way or a statistic or you're keeping track of how people are getting contaminated direct from people to people or indirect from object to people? Or is information that perhaps is not necessary at this point because of the crisis being, you know, trying to find a solution instead of finding out how people are getting contaminated? Uh, thank you for that question. So I'm doing a little bit of both of that. One, on one way, I'm assuming, and I think we should all assume, that everyone around us might asymptomatically be carrying this virus and, and treat it as such. It just a, helps you in your mind, even about yourself and the responsibility for yourself, to assume that um, and then act accordingly. But we're gathering all the data we can now, and we do have extensive investigations. Remember those disease detectives I talked about? Yes. We still have that work, that boot, bootstrap on the ground, epidemiologists going around cases and finding out who you have in contact. But as this spreads, it almost becomes impossible to contain all that. But on, you know, don't, do know this. Part of what I'm working on is building an amateur epidemiologic force and I'm also looking at state-of-the-art apps, apps where we at home 
can volunteer to talk about our situation. We are gonna gather information in new ways. Not only are we gonna have testing and traditional epidemiology going along, but in other countries around the world, they've made effective use of technology to self-report. Um, in the same way we use things like Alexa, the same way we do things um, and share information, we're not gonna be forcing people to share information, but I think there are gonna be uh, applications that we're looking at now um, where we can actually have people share information with us. The same way um, I think about when I'm out in the park, I see people going after Pokemon, uh, yes. trying to, I mean, I think there are ways um, that I'm looking at that are being used around the world where we can gather every kind of information. Um, but, but you know, that data right now is still scarce. And so I think everyone should just assume that the possibility is that we're all spreading it and, and do what you can to not be that spreader. Thank you. Gracias. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. That was the last question. Okay. Sometimes we get questions um, about who we're talking to. Uh, within the last 24 hours, uh, Dr. Acton and I have talked uh, with the governor of Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, and Indiana. And we find that each one of those conversations, sometimes involving uh, their, their health director, the director of health as well, something, I always take something away from that. And, uh, you know, we, we are in this together uh, with, with, with other states, and it's good particularly to talk to the governors who border Ohio uh, and just find out exactly how they're dealing with things, you know, what they expect, what they're predictions are, uh, projections are. So it's been very, very helpful. Um, I want to close with an email I got this morning uh, from a friend. Um, and I, I think it, it, it gives us kind of a look on the front line. Uh, for those of us who don't have a medical background, um, it gives us kind of a clue what the, the doctors and the nurses, the health professionals are, are dealing with as they get ready uh, for, for what is coming. And uh, let, me just, let me just read this. Uh, I'm currently ending 36 hours out of 48 hours in the emergency room. I've had some time to reflect on our current situation. Healthcare workers are a group of extremely well-meaning people that live and work to help others. They come together as a team to work together to save lives. This time the opponent is COVID-19. The likes of this is nothing that any of us have fought before or imagined could even happen. Every day, healthcare workers and I leave for work wondering if we will not see our family for 14 days. Even taking all the safety precautions, healthcare workers still may become exposed and contract the disease. I worry about the short supply of personal protective equipment. I know the state of Ohio, the federal government, and hospital systems are doing everything they can to provide us with this equipment, but we worry nonetheless. There are some wonderful healthcare systems, physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers here in Ohio coming together every day, providing the best care we can for these patients. There are so many others providing support, sewing masks, sending us food, giving us words of encouragement, and praying every day for us. He concludes, steady the course. The, the sun will continue to rise every day. As Ohioans and Americans, we will overcome and defeat this disease. He closes by saying, Godspeed, and it's signed, Dr. Steve Huffman. So Steve, to you and to every other health professional who's on the front line out there, uh, we thank you. Um, so for those of us who don't do this every day, it's really hard for us to imagine what you go through or what you're going to be going through. And the same is true for the folks who work in our nursing homes, uh, the people who are making home health visits uh, to people's homes. Uh, we know the risk is up. Uh, we know that this is a tough time. Uh, so again, we just thank you uh, for what you're doing. You're our heroes, and uh, we, we hope... Uh, and know that we're gonna, we're gonna get through this, but we wish you the best every single day. Tomorrow, uh, 
we are not going to be here. Uh, we'll be back Monday at 2 o'clock. Uh, the only exception to that will, would be if there's a, a breaking story uh, or if there is something that we really feel that we need to communicate to the public uh, tomorrow. Uh, but barring that, uh, we will not be here tomorrow. Uh, we will not be here at the press conference, at least. And uh, we'll be back here Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Thank you all very much. Have a good Sunday. Through 10, with a South African with a slim one-up lead, Molinari is rolling on Kevin Na. We now join our regularly scheduled program already in progress. The Invisible Man is in your home. Surprise. There you are. The Invisible Man. Rated R. Watch at home now. Two pastors have fallen on hard times. Our church was robbed. Who robs a church? And Sunday, could the wall answer their prayers? We could do a lot of good with that kind of money. The wall.